Okay, so we're coming back after the holidays, continuing on with Sefer Yov, the book of Yov. We're doing the second half of chapter Chavbe 22, and we'll go on to chapter 23. So we're pretty much almost about halfway through the book. Just want to give a brief introduction about a very important concept called Nisayon, test, trials. It comes up a little bit in this book. It is something that we spoke about in other lectures, but it's important to understand that many, many times uh, an individual may be going through a hard time, and all it really is is a test. Even though every situation in life ends up being a test, we're being tested all the time, but it's not necessarily by design. It's not intentional. There are sometimes, however, where Hashem tests the individual. The most famous one is Abraham Avinu. Hashem tested him, tested him more than once. And the big question is, why does Hashem test? Hashem can read our mind. Hashem knows whether we will be passing the test with flying colors, or Hashem we will fail. So what's the purpose of the test? Ultimately, the test achieves the following. It is an opportunity for the individual to grow, to elevate himself, to reach heights that he would not be able to reach had he not gone through this experience. So Hashem puts people in a certain situation, certain circumstances, and even though they may be challenging, if they do a good job, they're elevated, they grow with it, they mature, and of course, they're rewarded. This is an opportunity to be rewarded immensely if one passes the test. But I want to warn you, these are tests that Hashem decides to give the individual. What about if a person tells Hashem, Hashem, test me, and you will see that I will do a good job. I want to prove it to you that I'm a good servant. That, be careful with. Don't volunteer for a test. David HaMelech, David, asked Hashem to test him, and he didn't do such a good job. <laughs> we don't always know that a test is coming. And many times, even though it is a test, we don't know necessarily. That's the whole idea of being tested. We don't really know if it's a test. And even though Hashem knows the results, we don't know how we will behave, how will we act. You don't want to volunteer because a test can be very, very difficult indeed. And even though Hashem does not put us in a test that we cannot pass, He will not put it, us in such a test. If you ask for one, it, it may be actually very, very difficult. And it can come out of nowhere at a time when you least expect it. And therefore, it's not such a good idea. So even though Iyov will hint to this at times, if Hashem only tested me, I would prove it to him. That's something else. When Iyov says those words, he means to say that my heart is clean and Hashem knows that I am pure. If he were to investigate it, which Hashem, of course, doesn't need to, but if Hashem were to investigate me and test me, he would see for himself. So if you see that idea come up across in the book of Yoga, it's only a way of saying, Hashem knows the truth. He really, really knows that I am honest and that I am just and that I am innocent. If he only would test me, so it doesn't mean that he actually asked for a test, because it's not such a good thing. A test is also significant, because when one does go through it, he may know, he may find out at the very least where he's holding, on what level he is. Because if you fail, chaz shalom, you may feel bad about it. You know, oh, I should have done a better job. So sometimes it works out that the person will at least, at the very least, figure out where he's holding, on what level is he. So it may be to his benefit sometimes to realize that, just in case he thought that he was a much more righteous individual, here he was tempted and he failed. Mm -hmm. And that's no good. So therefore, there are all kinds of reasons of why Hashem puts us through tests. Eliphaz began the discussion in this chapter, but this time with a different approach. He realized that the first approach, the first time around, when he argued with Iov, Iov was able to give a rebuttal, as they say in English. 
he was able to point out to Elifaz, you don't know what you're talking about. In other words, in Yov's way of thinking, of course, we're not saying who's right and who's wrong right now, but he was not able to convince Yov. So therefore, he tried a different approach. And in that second approach, there's more of an emphasis on the importance of having free will. Hashem doesn't reveal himself completely. It appears to be, it appears that perhaps the righteous are not being rewarded and the wicked are somehow prospering, even though that's against Hashem's wishes. It's for sure against Hashem's wishes. And we believe in Hashem. Then what's this all about? So Eliphaz pointed out there's something called free will. In order to enable free will, real free will, that people do not know that Hashem is watching, that Hashem is aware, that there is judgment, accountability, then sometimes things like that happen that appear to be contradictory. But in reality, Hashem is around, Hashem is aware, and everything is being documented. You're not going to get away with it. So that was Eliphaz's second approach. I would like to add that Eliphaz says in different words, the famous, I think, saying in English, who laughs, laughs last. No? Something like that? Mm -hmm. no, something. Yeah. There was. In the end, someone is going to laugh. And that individual, the one that laughs at the end, is the one that was right all along. There was, even though up until the end, it did not appear that anyone knew with clarity who is right and who is wrong. Everybody claims to be right. So, who will laugh in the end? That's what matters. Because he will be able to point out. He will be able to laugh. You see, I was right all along. He who laughs at the end. So, why did I introduce this idea here? Because what's at the end? When will this at the end be? In Ulam Abba. And there's a famous, I don't know if it's a joke or if, if it's a saying, but there's definitely a lot of truth to it, that the two are arguing, two individuals, one believes in God and one does not, okay? One believes that there's a world to come, one believes that there's game home, and one does not. You're gone after you leave this world. There's nothing after that. That's what some people want to believe. So here you have this argument that you cannot necessarily prove. So when will it be known? After one dies, well, after one dies, you cannot ask him, you cannot communicate with him. But let's assume that the two individuals somehow came there at the same time. The one that always claimed, you see, there is Olam Abba, there is a world to come, there is Gan Eden, there is Gehenom. You see, I was right all along. And now, because you didn't follow the law, you're going to suffer. Right? If there is nothing, there is nothing. But if there is something, it's true. The person who did not believe, who made fun of it, will find out the bitter truth. So the question is, the joke is, what's better? To believe that there's nothing and to take a chance. You're taking a chance because if there is something, <laughs> it's going to be very, very painful. Or imagine to believe. 100% that there is something, mm -hmm. and as a result, to observe the Torah and the Mitzvot, and take a chance that if it's not true, what did you lose? So when you leave this world, let's say, let's say there's nothing. That's it, you disappear. What did you lose by being a good man or woman? What did you lose by observing Hashem's laws? You were a kind person. Did you lose anything? So you didn't enjoy everything? What's the big deal? Who has more to lose? The one that doesn't want to believe. The one that says, there's nothing. Oh yeah, there's nothing? Let's wait and see. You have a lot more to lose than I will. Because if I was wrong, that there is nothing, I didn't really lose anything. I lived a good life. I observed the mitzvot. I was a nice gentleman. <laughs> but you who did not do anything proper, you have a lot to lose. So, in reality, the point here is, Yov doesn't really know. Neither do his friends know with certainty anything. But Yov has a lot to lose. Yov, if he's wrong in some ways, he's going to find out 
he's going to find out the truth at some point, and he's going to realize that it was not right of him to say what he said. Even though, remember, Iyo is a just individual, but don't necessarily believe so strongly that you are 100% right, because just in case you're not, it's going to be disappointing. So therefore, the reason I mention this is that even someone like Yov, who's very, very firm in his beliefs, and there's no reason he should be, because he doesn't have proof, right? At the very least, be open. Be open to the idea that somebody else may be right, and allow yourself to think, perhaps, like him, and this will perhaps open up other doors, other possibilities of understanding life. But you will see that Yom is very, very stubborn in the way he thinks. And that is why this is a little bit of a problem. So I use this more as an example for those who think that they are right, who think that their beliefs are the correct ones, and they're going to find out that it's not so. It's not going to be so pleasant. So be open. So Eliphaz continues on in chapter 22 and says, you know what? I heard your arguments about how it doesn't make sense and so forth, that there is divine providence, that Hashem is involved. I heard all your arguments. But you know what? You can really reach the opposite conclusion of what you're saying. You're, I can use your arguments, your examples, your experience, and I can come to the opposite, exact opposite of conclusion, that yes, there is, there must be a world to come. It doesn't make sense otherwise. In other words, as long as you believe in Hashem, we have to make that as a premise. People who don't believe yet that there is a God, that's a whole different issue. We first have to convince them that there is a God. But we're assuming everybody does. Here, everybody does. Everybody believes God created the world. There's a little bit of a question of how he manages this world, or does he manage at all? There's a lot of questions. There appear to be contradictions. Can we sort this out? Perhaps we can't even figure it out. Here, all the friends of Yehovah are telling him, yes, this is the way it is. <laughs> They're confident. Yehovah says, no, not necessarily. I'm confident about what I'm saying. Remember, there's no Torah here. Who's to tell them? There is some level of prophecy, by the way. That there is. But still, Yehovah insists more on the philosophical way of thinking, on the logical way of thinking. He wants to use the sechel. He wants to use what his brain tells him. Who's to say what your brain tells you is correct? So there's a little bit of a problem with that. So Eliphaz says, I can reach the opposite conclusion. How do we know that there is a mashgiach, that there is someone, there is a God who's watching over us? Since we do know from what we're told, that the nefesh is eternal. Not the body, the physical body, we all agree that it rots in the ground, it decomposes. But the nefesh, if you believe that there's such a thing as the soul, the soul does not just disappear. The soul is eternal. If the soul is eternal, then why focus on the body, why focus on reward in this world? If we're saying that the soul is eternal, then perhaps the reward is in the world to come. What's wrong with that? You know, you focus too much on the physical body. And that, I agree with you, the body decomposes. It's finished. But wait a minute. It has to be that there's something more to this world, something beyond this world, because we deal with a nefesh, a nefesh is eternal. So the nefesh is going to be rewarded, not the physical body. Even though we spoke about the physical body being rewarded as well, when the dead will rise. So, as far as all the wicked people that you complained about that they're prospering, they're going to get what they deserve in the next world. There is a next world because that's the only way you can understand it. In other words, it doesn't make sense to say that everything is finished once you're, you die. We talk about there's something to the human being that is eternal. There must be a world to come. I can reach that conclusion too. That this is the only way to understand why the wicked are prospering. Because in reality, it doesn't make sense. I agree with you, Yo. Yes, you're right. Then it must be 
that there's a continuation, especially if we make this very, very important assumption that the nefesh is eternal. So, at that point, when the wicked get to Olam Abba, the world to come, that's when they will be destroyed. That's when they, they will be punished, and that will be their end, if they were very, very wicked. And the reason why this needs to be like that is because we all agree, me and you, Hashem doesn't do anything that is an avel, anything that's really, really wrong and distorted. Just that would not make any sense. We all are in agreement. So one way to figure this out is to say that there is continuation. And if there is continuation, there is mishpat, there will be judgment in the world to come. So therefore, Yov, please, Eliphaz continues on, get used to being close to Hashem. And do what I told you that you were not doing so well. Do your mitzvot l'shem shamayim for the sake of heaven. Don't look forward to reward. Don't do things for some self-interest or some self-gain. No, do it for the real reason, for Hashem's sake. In this way, if you do so, you will acquire all the good that is coming to you. You will also be known as someone who worshipped Hashem out of love not out of fear of being punished or in anticipation of some reward. So this is part of the Eliphaz's approach that Iyov, you possibly did not do things right, even though they were right, they were correct. But if you did it for yourself, for your own selfish interest, because you were afraid of God's punishment or you wanted to, to be rewarded, then that's not complete. And of course Iyov is going to argue with this too, that he didn't do so. But now he's being accused that perhaps this is where your mistake is. You thought yourself such a great guy, but perhaps it was not so great after all because you had in mind the reward or you were afraid of the punishment. Please, Yov, do things for the real reasons. Do things out of love. And don't, don't rely on philosophical beliefs or logic because that will not lead you to anywhere. On the contrary, you can make many, many mistakes if you follow that line of thinking. Accept, accept the word of Hashem through prophecy, whatever level of prophecy existed then, and there was some level of prophecy. Accept any teachings, any Torah that comes through real prophecy. That is safer than just relying on your logic or on philosophical ideas. Take the words, therefore, that you hear that are divine and put them in your heart. In other words, accept them, live by them, and focus on those words instead of what your physical body is telling you. Because the physical body has needs, physical needs. It enjoys the pleasures. And if you follow that too much, you will be distracted. You will not think correctly. You will be influenced by your body. So you want to be influenced by divinity. If you follow the divine word that we are sharing with you, this way you will be close to Hashem. This way you will be able to build your relationship with Hashem. This way your nefesh will also become more elevated and closer to Hashem. On the other hand, if you like yourself, you care about yourself, then what will happen is that you will be influenced instead by the Yetzirah, by the Yetzirah, who will seduce you, who will incite you. And of course, that will get you carried away off the path and not very, very close to Hashem. So that's what happens many, many times when people follow their own thinking. And that thinking sometimes is influenced by one's physical needs. It's biased instead of trusting perhaps the better advice of others who are more experienced, more knowledgeable, and especially if they have some divine information. We have the Torah, and that's what we rely on. That is how we live our life. And even if we have the Torah, there's always the danger that people will be swayed by the evil inclination. Sure, it all depends if people are not honest with themselves. Yeah. They're not necessarily after the truth. They have interests. They can fall in the trap of the evil inclination.
What's the advantage of becoming close to Hashem? And he finds it in different words. I'm pretty much paraphrasing what he's saying instead of going through the words of the Pasukim. Basically, he's saying, when you get close to Hashem, the more you're closer to Hashem, the less you will value the physical pleasures of this world, the less you will value materialism, the closer you are to Hashem. Everything that you see in this world that people value, like gold and silver, to you it will be like dirt. And that's a very, very powerful statement. The more, the more one is closer to Hashem, the more spiritual he is, the less he's interested in the physicality. And since you're not as interested in the physicality, you will not rely on it either. Some people are afraid of losing money. Some people rely on their money, on their homes, on all their assets. It gives them the sense of freedom or power. Rely on Hashem. Hashem is your stronghold. He will protect you. He will watch over you. And any money that you do have will be elevated. What does it mean? He says those words. Your money will become elevated. Possibly it means that the money that you used properly will be elevated to a higher level because you used it wisely, you gave charity, right? Or it means that the real money, the real silver, will be your relationship with Hashem. Because in the end, if we observe the Torah and Mitzvot, that is permanent. That remains with us. The money that we make here in this world does not stay with us. We leave it behind. So elevated could be several things here. That that which you valued so much that is earthly, in the end, hopefully, you will realize that it's not so valuable. And you will not depend on it. And instead, you will come to realize that you should depend on Him. He is your stronghold. He is the one that protects not your money. And therefore, it's important to develop that relationship. Once you do, you will really have what we call in Hebrew, onik ruchani, a spiritual pleasure, instead of the onik gashmi, a physical pleasure. It's a different kind of pleasure, something completely different. In order to be able to understand what kind of pleasure that is, what it feels like, you have to experience it. But it's a whole different scenario, it's a whole different experience. Something so pleasurable that people who actually have it are able to minimize so easily the physical pleasures. Once you experience it, it will be much easier to do the will of Hashem as well. Sometimes people struggle, they're not so sure they want to do it, they're not in the mood. Once they realize how beautiful it is and how pleasurable it is, of course, that's, they're drawn to it automatically. What else? Well, once you get close to Him, if you turn to Him and pray to Him, He will actually listen to you. There's a better chance He will. And He continues on to say, Eliphaz, and you will pay off your nedarim, your vows, your promises that you made when you were in trouble, you were sick, you were struggling, you were in pain. People make vows. That's one of the only times the rabbis recommend to make a vow of nedarim because it can actually save you from trouble. If you're in a very, very difficult situation that you don't see any way out, sometimes that's the only time it's advisable. Make a net Hashem, if you get me out of this, I promise that I will do this. Something special, of course. Something very special. Something you would not otherwise do, but because one is in the hospital, one is in jail, there's no other way out. Make a net, a very powerful net. It will make an impression. So Elifaz is telling me, you know, once you get close to Hashem, you will see, you will end up paying off your vows. In other words, because you will see that Hashem has taken you out. He listened to your prayers. He accepted your vows. So, it's a way of saying, get close to Him while you're here. Focus on that. And you will see how much you will give from all of this. Then he goes on to say, by the way, you may not even need to pray to Him. You will be on such a high level that when a righteous individual reaches a very, very high level, Tzadik Gozer, the Kadosh Baruch Hu You will decree, you will say, this is the way it should be. And Hashem will agree with you. That is the level that many, many great Tzadikim, righteous people reached. That they blessed a couple who was childless. No way, no way that he can ever have children. You will have a child by the end of the year. Wow, and they did. Where did that come from? 
Obviously, the tzaddikim, the real tzaddikim, have power, but what kind of power is this? It's a power that they don't even have to pray and ask. They say, there's such a high level that if they say, of course, Hashem has to agree with it. But their saying, their decree is very powerful. And the reason behind this is because they've become so holy that the teva, nature, nichnat bifnehem. Nature, the laws of nature, humbles itself before them. They control nature. That's an incredible level. And there are many, many stories, many stories of tzaddikim who reach this level, of course. And their blessing or their decree, their statement was so powerful that Hashem went along with them and agreed with the blessing. And if Fasca continues up to say, and once you get closer and closer to Hashem, a lot of the stuff that was so dark to you, like clouds, clouds covered and you couldn't understand, you will have greater clarity. All of a sudden you will see light. A lot of times we don't understand, but all of a sudden Hashem illuminates our eyes and we see things that we did not see before, or we become aware of things that we did not know before. Up until now, Eliphaz tells him, you know what happened to you? Your way, your way in life, your derech, your path, lowered you because you were in a lower world. You were stuck in this physical world. So your path, your direction, became lower as a result. Now that you're going to be closer to Hashem, you're going to trust Him fully, that will elevate you, elevate your path, and it will remove any cover, any physical cover, any materialistic cover that was in the way. The materialistic cover is usually the tavot, the desires that people have to indulge in all the pleasures of this physical world. So when the clouds are removed, when a person finally gains clarity, oh wow, why was that? what was I going after? nonsense, vanities, it's worthless. So you can see how far people are on the average when they're so attracted and so interested in this physical world. They're so far from having a very close relationship with Hashem and realizing that there are other more important things in life. They're so immersed in this that they don't see. Something is covering their eyes. That's the physicality. So your path will become elevated. You will grow. You will become closer to Hashem. And so much will be apparent to you that was not apparent before. At that point, Hashem will always help you out. Especially if you continue to be humble and trusting of Him. Hashem will help you. You're in a difficult situation. Yes, you're being challenged. Correct. But Hashem will help you. The fact that you trust in Him. That in itself is a merit, it's a big merit. One who has true bitachon, true trust in Hashem, that in itself can help him out of a, of a problem that he's in. But it has to be true. Not everybody has this pure bitachon. Yes, I trust Hashem. Do you really? Let's see. Let's see what happens. So sometimes a person is put into a situation just to find out. Hashem, of course, knows, but he will find out whether he really had bitachon in Hashem or not. Did he really, really trust? If you do so, you will see Hashem will help you. And he finishes up by telling him, just make sure that you remove any bad qualities that you may have, any bad midot, bad characteristics, any sin that you may still Just make sure that you are completely clean. So being humble is good, of course. Being trustful of Hashem is very, very good. But make sure that there's no other baggage. <laughs> Otherwise, it's incomplete. So if you do so, you're clean, you stay clean, then of course Hashem will always be with you. Okay, so that was chapter 22, and we're going to go now a little bit into chapter 23. What have we seen so far? That in the approach of Eliphaz, there are two ideas, the new approach of Eliphaz. One idea is a response or an explanation that a tzaddik, a righteous person who may have served Hashem, but served Hashem not completely, instead in anticipation of reward or because he was afraid of punishment, that some of the suffering that he may go through in this world, according to Eliphaz, is to refine him for Olam Abba. In other words, according to the way Eliphaz explains it, it is possible if someone's service of Hashem was incomplete, 
that just for that alone, he will be refined and some of the pain and suffering can be explained that this is for the good of the righteous individual. You're a good man. Let's refine you here. So upstairs, you're completely clean. Yes. So it is possible, but that would be one explanation, according to Olifaz, of why an individual may be suffering. His avodah, his service of Hashem, is incomplete. The second response that deals more with the success of the reshaim, of why do we see wicked people doing so great, Elifaz introduced and emphasized the important idea, which is right, by the way, that there needs to be free will. I'm not saying that Elifaz is completely right here. I'm just saying that the idea behind free will is 100% true. Hashem wants there to be free will, and sometimes people appear to be getting away with it. Hashem does not interfere, because He wants them to have free will. If He did, then there would be no free will. We would automatically do the right thing or stay away from doing the wrong thing. Okay, so concerning the first response, dealing with doing the service of Hashem, not properly. Yov has a problem with that. In chapter 23, Yov says, no, this, this doesn't make sense. I don't agree with you. <laughs> you know what? You know why? It doesn't make sense that such harsh pain and suffering should come to an individual just because his service to Hashem was incomplete. In other words, I'm not denying that a person maybe should sometimes suffer a little bit, or Hashem will show his displeasure for him, or that his reward will not be complete because he did it for ulterior motive. You did not disagree with that. It doesn't make sense what you're saying applies to me. The amount of pain and suffering that I went through, that that should be the explanation because I did not serve Hashem, Leshem Shammai for the sake of That's too much. No, that's exaggerated. It doesn't make sense. And he's right. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. So a righteous individual, just because he's pnia, he had pniyot, he had some other intention here, it was a little bit because he was afraid <laughs> or he wanted to be rewarded, he wanted to be a good person, but he wasn't doing it for the sake of it. For that, so Yov says, I don't buy what you say. Besides that, Yov says, if I need to, I can prove it that I was a good person, that I was honest, that I followed the Torah mitzvot, that I did, I did the will Hashem Shemaim, I can prove it. So what you say is wrong. It's completely not true. It does not apply to me. Because I can also prove that I did it for the right reasons. Yes, it's possible that once in a while, I was concerned about being punished, that I obviously wanted to have a, a big share in the world to come. It's possible, but it didn't happen regularly. Once in a while. But once I focused on my connection with Hashem, then I got back on the right path, and I continuously did it for His sake. So, Eliphaz, no, what you're saying is totally off, not right. So what does Yov say? He's going back, always, going back to his original statement. I therefore am convinced, he says, that everything has been predestined, predetermined, including my level, including my level of righteousness. Hashem made me the way I am. The world is this way, that things follow the mazal, the stars, which determine a person's mazal at the time of birth, and therefore, there's no regulation here based on one's behavior. Yov says, that's the only way I can explain it, because otherwise it doesn't make sense to me why Hashem is doing it this way. You see how Yov is going back to his original statement that it must be that everything is known to Hashem. Hashem made it this way, wants it this way, doesn't get involved unless the world just run it almost on its own. In chapter 24, he will continue on telling off Eliphaz about why what he said about the tranquility or prosperity of the Rishayim is wrong, why he disagrees with that theory. But here he continues on to talk more about himself. He will tell us, for example, I'll give you just an example, he will tell us, he will tell Alifaz, you want to keep them around for free will? <laughs> the Rishayim, you want to let them just prosper and be successful. 
Does that make sense? That God will do that? You know how destructive they are with their wars? You know how many millions of people these Rashaim kill? You don't want to tell me that just to enable free will, <laughs> he would do that, God would do something like that. And by the way, I can, I can, I can give you a way well, this will not interfere with the, with the free will. I can have, I can demonstrate a way that Hashem can eliminate them in their caves, in their homes, before they actually go out and do any damage. No one will ever find out about it, and so it won't interfere with free will. Nobody will ever know they got killed, that they died from a heart attack. It was, come on, Eliphaz, I can show you ways where the free will here will not make a difference. So this, We'll talk a little bit more about in chapter 24, where Yom does a pretty good job sometimes. You know, even though he's not always right, but his rebuttals are pretty strong. You see how he, he expresses himself? He, ha he makes a point. He says, just for free will? Even though Eliphaz is right, yes, for free will, a lot of things sometimes don't make sense to us. But that's Hashem's way of concealment. Hashem can do anything he wants. The Rashaim eventually will pay for it. When and how, only Hashem knows. He continues on to complain, Yo, that he said it before as well. There's no approach for Hashem. I wish I could just approach him, speak to him, argue with him, and prove to him that I'm a good person. You know why? Because if I would be able to do that, if I would be given a chance, to argue with Hashem face to face, then at least I wouldn't feel so bad. Even though he would tell me whatever Hashem wants to tell me, but at the very least, I wouldn't feel bad. Here, the fact that I'm not able even to talk to him, to complain, to bring up my points, that bothers me a lot. It brings me tremendous anguish that I, can, I have no one to turn to. That's a very important idea, what he says here, because it reminds us how important it is when people do have questions and doubts, they should speak to someone, someone knowledgeable, someone that can help them, because sometimes people are in so much pain just because they have no one to turn to. They should, they should be able to speak to someone, and if you know someone like that, that needs help, at the very least, to talk to someone who may be able to help them. So now, he says, I have no way of bringing up my case before him. Because even if I did, by the way, I don't think he would even answer me. And this is also not completely accurate. Because I have a very important revelation for you. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, when we talk to Hashem, either in our prayers or on our own, when we're by ourselves, we say, Hashem, please, can you show me what I'm supposed to do? Or can you help me with understanding something? Hashem sometimes will show us in a miraculous way, in an indirect way. We will receive an answer to our question, but we may not even realize it. If you're sensitive enough, then you will pick up on it. If Hashem answers, in other words, obviously a person has to be at the level, his prayers have to be sincere, he has to be a good individual, Hashem will answer him either in a dream or in real life. All of a sudden, he will be saved miraculously. He's in battle. And there were soldiers who said, Hashem, if you exist, please point it out to me. Make me a little miracle. And they saw miracles. Exactly after they asked for it, a few minutes later. And that was enough. That's all they needed. So sometimes we're lucky and we see it right away. Sometimes it takes time. But Hashem does answer. Here Yom is concerned. Even if I were to address him, even if I were to argue with him, Hashem may not even answer me. And if he does, I may not understand his language, he says. Or it may be too difficult to comprehend what he's saying, or why he's doing something. So therefore, Yov goes on to say what I said earlier, that I believe that everything has been predetermined. There's such a thing as free will. Everything is pre-programmed. This is the way Hashem wants his world to be like. Now, let me remind you of another important point. Yov here, as an example, is reminding us how stubbornness is so unhealthy. How if you're set in your way, in your views, and you're not willing to entertain that you're wrong, that there's possibility, 
reason to change, but this is the way it's going to be, then you're inviting many, many problems. Because sometimes you have to have the leap of faith. Sometimes you have to agree. I don't know. It hasn't been demonstrated to me. There's no convincing proof. Yes, but I'm going to take the leap of faith. Because once you do that, then a lot of doors open up. A lot of things become clearer and we have more explanations than without taking that leap of faith. So by Yov saying, this is the way I think it has to be, that's the only thing that will make sense to me. The only thing, come on, have you thought of everything? He's shutting off, he's shutting the doors. So don't shut the doors. Allow yourself the opportunity to consult and to investigate, to do more research perhaps, because it is not really possible. It's, it's really not completely possible to know Hashem's ways. And that is why Yov uses a very poetic description of trying to figure out Hashem. And he says like this, I can't figure him out from the front or from the back. What does that mean? Well, if you recall, Hashem told Moshe Rabbeinu, you will not see my face, but you will see my back. Does Hashem have a back? No, it's mer metaphorical. Hashem doesn't have a front or a back. It means, according to some commentaries, that when we see something happening, we're seeing it up front, we don't understand why it's happening. After it has happened, we're looking at it from the back, we may be able to figure it out and to understand it better. So sometimes we don't understand things when they happen, as they're happening. We're seeing the front. Years later, perhaps, not a week or two, perhaps years later, we will look back and say, whether it applies to us or to the entire nation or to the world. Now it makes a little bit more sense why this had to be that way. Why? Why did it have to be that way? It's easier to understand after the fact. But here, Yo is just using this idea, poetically, that no matter how I look at Hashem and try to figure it out from this front or from the back, however you look at it, whatever direction you're looking at it, I cannot figure it out because it's too difficult. And Yov is also saying that even though there's various Hanagot of Hashem, there is the natural nature, the natural way that Hashem conducts Himself in this world through the laws of nature, and there is the miraculous way. Through either one of the two, I cannot understand His ways, because through the natural way, if I look at the laws of nature, if I look at logic, for example, things don't make sense to me. They don't add up. Why are they the way they are? And if I look at it through the miraculous way, I can't even see it. I don't, I don't see enough of it to be able to make any determination. So regardless of how you look at Hashem's interaction with this world, either through the natural laws or through the miraculous ways, it's difficult to figure out. One doesn't make sense, the natural one. To you, it doesn't make sense. And the miraculous, we don't see enough of it. If we saw more miracles, perhaps we would understand. But we don't. But Yov says, you know what, I can't find Hashem, I can't speak to Hashem, I can't approach Hashem, but He can approach me. <laughs> Let Him come to me and test me and check me out. This is why I told you before about being tested. Let Hashem come to me. And if He does, He will examine me and He will say that I have gone in the right path. I have done things properly. I did observe His misvot, and I did not do it out of fear or out of anticipation of being compensated for it. My thinking was never the logical thinking. I did it completely for him. Not only did I do it for him, I observed his commandments much more than I took care of myself. So he hope He's really pointing out to Lifaz, please. You don't realize who you're talking to. If Hashem would only come, he would see. He would examine me, he would see through me. He would see that I did do everything properly. Hashem knows all this, he often continues on to say. And it's not possible to contradict Hashem. So if Hashem knew how I will be, it's a famous philosophical question, He knew the future, He knew that I will be righteous and I will do things properly, you can't go against that. So you see, Eliphaz, can you go against Hashem? If Hashem knows this in advance, and He made it so, that everything should be this way in advance, then where is the free will? It's a famous question. Is there really free will if Hashem knows the future? And of course, Hashem still gives us the ability to do things on our own. Hashem's knowledge does not interfere. It's hard for us to comprehend that. 
But Hashem's knowledge is not dependent on time. Hashem knows everything in advance before the world was created. That does not interfere. We are still endowed with the ability to make decisions. Otherwise, we're robots, and that doesn't make sense at all. But Yob is taking the approach that because things don't make sense to him, it must be this is the way Hashem wanted it to be, and you cannot go against Hashem's wishes, because you, you know, that would not make any sense at all either, that you, that you can go against Hashem's wishes. So could you do anything different than Hashem? No. This is the way, therefore, he wanted me to be. This is the way he wanted the world to be. And he basically goes on to say, and my fear of heaven was always the, the more pure form of fear, not because of punishment. So, yes, I did complain, but you should know, my complaints were only because of the pain and suffering I was going through. I would have preferred that Hashem take me from this world and not suffer so much. And if He had taken me from this world for whatever reason, I would have accepted it lovingly. But the pain and suffering, it could drive people crazy. And we all agree about that. Even though Hashem would never put us in that kind of situation that we can't handle, but here, this was very, very intense. And you can't blame me, therefore, if occasionally I said what I said, it was only because of the pain and suffering. And as a result of the pain and suffering, my heart melted. And that's why I reacted the way I did. So just to finish up the chapter, it's important to keep in mind that it's true that people who go through challenges in life, painful challenges, we can't blame them if they don't react properly 100% because that's a lot more difficult than dying, being killed. Because if you're being killed for what you believe in, you die and you don't feel any pain after that. But imagine suffering, being tortured, persecuted every day for who knows how many years for what you believe in. It puts people in a very, very difficult situation. What should I do? You can't run away. A lot of Jews face this kind of a dilemma. Should they give up, God forbid, the Shabbat? Otherwise, they're being threatened by being fired. Should they become atheists in the Soviet Union back then? When having a religion meant that you'd be sent off to Siberia. Or you would not get a job. You would not be promoted. And that's easy. What about torture during the Inquisition? much more difficult to handle than being killed on the spot. To be tortured, much more difficult. So therefore the rabbis tell us when it comes to the famous test that Abraham Avinu went through, Akedat Yitzchak bringing his own son, his own, even though he had Yishmael, but this is the son of Sarah. This is who he was looking forward to having, this son who will inherit him and continue his path for him to be taken away like that by his own hands. It was a very difficult test. But wait a minute. A lot of people lost kids. There's a famous story of Hannah and her seven children who were killed on the spot. There were other righteous people who gave their life. What about them? Why is Abraham's test remembered so much that it's a merit for us? Because Abraham would have to live with this for the rest of his life. He would remain alive. It was his son that would be possibly taken from him. So he's not dying. People who have died, Kiddush Hashem, sanctifying Hashem, they died. Yes, a lot of people did that. But to live with the pain for the rest of your life is a lot more difficult. For, therefore, for Yitzhak, it was not as difficult as it was for the father. Yitzhak is being put through the test too. And he says, I'm willing to go. HaKidush Hashem. Abraham Zavino's test is greater than the test of Yitzhak. People who have had to have, people who have had to endure this kind of a test, Hashem is more. Very, very difficult. To see their entire families being killed in front of them. Very, very painful. But those who were courageous, as soon as the war finished, started their life all over again. Rebuilt it, got married again, had kids, did not lose any hope. That is a very important idea to take with us, that regardless of the situation, God willing, there will be better days that we should look forward to. And not have to lose hope. The more we're connected to Hashem, the greater our connection to Hashem is, 
the stronger we will be to be able to resist all the pressures in the world. None of those pressures can extinguish the love that we have for Hashem. And that is why we're here today, because our forefathers demonstrated this when many, many times they were prepared to give their lives. Al-Kirush Hashem.